This is the start of the second week of, the, of this year's um, New Zealand Music Producer Series. Um, my name is Greg Haver. I'm a producer based in New Zealand. I um, spent most of my career working in the UK and Europe, and, um, and now I live here. And now I'm uh, just about to become a citizen of New Zealand, which is. In fact, I was meant to do my ceremony yesterday, but we were in Wellington at the Artisan Awards, so we'll have to wait till next year. Um, a few thank yous before we start. Um, firstly, our partner, Recorded Music New Zealand, uh, Damien, Dean, Mark and Sarah. Without them, this wouldn't happen. They, they, they put their hands deep in their pockets and they find the money to make this happen. So they're our main, our main partner. We've got some sponsors, Enzo Lanier, Apra Amcos, Auckland Council. And just want to acknowledge that Auckland is now a UNESCO city of music. So it's, um, it's important that, the, uh, the, that we support events like this because um, you know, it's, it's, it's a privilege to, to actually have that status. So, so anything that's got UNESCO City of Music on, you know, please go to it. Um, our tertiary spon uh, education sponsor is SAE Auckland. They're sponsoring the, uh, the public seminars and um, they're, they're being really helpful um, throughout the whole process. And thanks to Dave and Suzette. Um, thanks to, to Roundhead Studios, Emily, Paddy, Charlotte, obviously Neil and Sharon. Um, I'm sure Neil would love to be here, but he's too busy Fleetwood Mac in at the moment. Um, earning, earning some money to pay for nice new gear for the studio, hopefully. Put your wages up, Paddy, maybe? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, the, uh, the goal of the, the New Zealand Music Producer Series is to um, work with producers and engineers who are already decided on a career in that, in that area and to help them upskill and to sort of give them new ideas and new approaches to recording. And um, yeah, it's been it's um, it's a really it's really great to see sort of um, engineers and producers kind of learning these really cool new ideas when they come in. So you know, if 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 this if this is a career you want, you know, please apply for the next one. There's limited places, but it's uh, it's a, you know the workshops we do here for um, sort of four days are, re are really interesting. And um, so you know, have a look. Um, I'll be, be doing it again next year. So so apply if you if you want to make a career at music. Um, any hashtags NZ producer series? Just, just um, please give us a give us a post. Um, so, I'd like to a little bit of background on tonight's special guest. Um, Sylvia began her career as part of the San Francisco alt punk scene in the all-female band Revolver. In the late eight, 1980s, she became engineer at Larrabee Sound in Los Angeles, engineer for Prince, Paula Abdul, Big Daddy Kane, Seal, and Aerosmith. Had to produce undertow and opiate albums for, for Tool. And she then began to working with the producer Rick Rubin, which included the system of a down, Smashing Pumpkins, Tom Petty, and Johnny Cash. After a stint at Sound City Studio, she set up her own Radio Star Studios in Weed, California. Sylvia now travels widely, holding seminars around the world to share her unusual techniques for manipulating sound. Welcome, Sylvia, the legendary <laughs> We might as well start with the albums that and the and the jobs that changed your career. You know, which were those key records that that you felt that there was a, a major jump in in your status as a producer and engineer? You know, there's everyone's got those key records. What do you feel would be those in your career, Sylvia? Well, I hello. Um, uh, let's see. Probably the first album that made a huge difference was um, the uh, Green Jello album which is ridiculous because it was a, it's a comedy record it's a comedy record and it and we were just goofing off when we recorded it initially and then uh, someone really liked it and the label put some more money behind it and we did a uh, studio quality version of the same album uh, and uh, and one day I was uh, assisting at Larrabee Sound and my boss came in with a billboard and he says your your singles number 24 on the on the singles <laughs> chart and it and it was three little pigs this ridiculous song um, but uh, so yeah that was uh, that was the moment that everything shifted because uh, before then as an assistant I was always trying to uh, Get a get some work from uh, labels or managers, and trying to to uh, secure a manager, get an, a manager interested in in um, representing me. And I knocked on all the doors of all the all the big management companies in in LA, and I got nothing. You know, I, I would had meetings, but no callbacks. And but when I had a a song on the charts, 
everybody it called. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it was a big shift. There was a huge shift with that. Is it wasn't always strange that sort of as 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 a producer or engineer, you were the same person the next day, but how people's perceptions it was suddenly different because you got those credits. It just seems to make all the you know, one hit record just makes all the difference. <laughs> one hit record. That I mean, really, yeah. all you need is one hit, and then all of a sudden everything changes. The doors open up. So the um, so so it was so Green Jenner were friends with Tool. If I'm correct, is that is that how that came about? That's right. In fact, uh, the singer from Tool, uh, Maynard James Keenan, actually sang part of um, that song, the Three Little Pigs song. Right. He sings the part that goes, uh, "Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin." <laughs> it's Maynard, and then the drummer Danny Carey played on uh, the Green Jello record also. Right, right. So it was a. Uh, in fact. Uh, we recorded the Green Jello album at um, Sound City, which was a place that I really wanted to work at. I'd heard that it was a, a great place, a great room, and it had the equipment that I really wanted to work on, uh, which was a Neve 8028 console. And uh, so I booked the room when we got a budget to do Green Jello. I booked the room, and since the same label was interested in, in doing this new band tool, and Danny's drums were already set up. We just cut the EP right there for, right. for opiate. That's for Yeah, I know, right? And uh, that, yeah. So uh, it was because of Green Jelly that I was working with Tool, basically. So the, um, so was, what, did you start as an as an engineer's role with Tool, and then shift to producer, or were you always the producer for the for the band? Well, that that role changed because. Uh, because I knew how to use all the equipment, um, I got the role of being the engineer. But at the time, since there was no producer, and uh, I would sit in their rehearsals, and they were struggling with parts, I would make suggestions. Deci I just decided, well, I didn't even know I was producing. I was just like, well, look, maybe you should try this and try this. And it, then I realized that, oh, I'm taking this role and so I took it more seriously, and and um, and and it was a natural thing. I think yeah. it's it's more than just documenting. You know, engineering can be documenting a, a sound or a performance, uh, but production is much more than that. I mean, you're actually adding um, your creative input and making decisions that the artist could also make. Yeah. So the. There wasn't there a moment where you actually had to present them with a producer contract? Yes, and there was that. I mean, at the at the end of uh, uh, or during the middle of Undertow, um, I had my contract ready, a production contract, and I was being hired as the producer, and I got money for production, but I also wanted points, and we had agreed to that, but. There's nothing, you know, there, there's really no agreement until someone signs the contract. So I had to hand them the contract several times. <laughs> and it was actually being mixed, the record was being mixed when I finally, on the very last day of the mix, got them to sign. I was not going to let them leave without signing. Were you going to sort of hold, hold the, the master tapes ransom? Well, I, it was actually out of my hands. I didn't mix the, the oh, Undertow right, record. Right. Ron St. Germain did, but right. I was there every day, you know, checking. I was part of that mix process, too. So, but yeah, I did get them to sign. And that made, you know, I think that's when you really kind of, uh, there's another shift when that happens, when you're able to um, get paid for your uh, your production and and receive royalties. I mean, they're really iconic records, and they're also records that, that musicians really loved. And I always found that there were some of those really key moments in trying to build a production career, you do the, do the records that, that musicians really love, love to listen to, because you know, they, you know, the, they, get, they get involved in that, you know, that sort of, you know, they have that primal response to the music, and they really want to sort of be, they want their bands to sound like that, you know. But, but at the time, honestly, we were just making music that we liked. We could give a shit what anyone else really liked, you but know. But it does not make the best music, though, <laughs> when you have that freedom, you're not overthinking it. That's true, yeah. So, in fact, at the end of the Undertow record, when we got back, got the mastering back and we listened to it, um, the, the entire album, we, we all kind of looked at each other thinking, wow, this sounds weird. You know, it doesn't sound like anything else. We're not sure if anyone's going to like it, but we like it, so 
That's all that matters. Oh, luckily, lots of other people liked it too. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's let step back a bit. So, obviously, you, you had a really good set of skills at that point. So, how did you get to that point? I was really interested to find out that that you started in radio, which is something I didn't know. And um, actually, hearing you on BFM earlier, it was like you just became you're such a natural on radio. It was it was really interesting to hear. But um, so how so how did were you engineer at radio as well, or just on air personality, or, or what, what? How did that that you morph from like radio through to actually engineering and producing artists? Well, at the time I went to university, there was no um, music recording uh, courses. In fact, I actually went to university for art, for fine art. And but then when I heard the college radio station, I became really interested because I love the music. And so I started by doing artwork flyers <laughs> for the radio station and then spent enough time there that, that I, uh, I got an on-air position um, and got to play music that I chose, you know, out of the library, which was so fun. And then um, through that I was able to learn how to use the, the equipment, um, the recording equipment in the production room. So I learned how to re use a two-track and then a four-track and the microphones and the routing with the little... I had rotary pots on my uh, on my mixer, you know, and yeah, it was uh, I I wanted to spend all my time there, but at getting out of college, I went into commercial radio and immediately realized that it was not about music. Right. It's not about music; it's yeah. about commercials. So yeah, yeah. Uh, formats change, and suddenly I was doing the news, and then I was like, "Oh, this is I, I'm not interested in this." So I uh, I uh, took a starting position in a radio production house, and then the minute that I could get into a music recording studio, I I took a position. I I actually didn't have to make coffee initially. I I got a job as an engineer. So what studio was was that? It was a place called Bear West in San Francisco. Right. So, so did you spend a long time in San Francisco? Were, were you quite a part of the the, you know, the music scene there? Was it? Yeah, there were. Uh, I had my own band there. Uh, several bands, actually, a all girl metal band and an all girl punk band, and and I worked uh, on my own recordings as well as other people's recordings. And um, I spent maybe six six or seven years there, and worked on a project with uh, Kirk Hammett, and we co-produced a project. And he was a young guitar player that had just joined Metallica. And um, uh, we co-produced a project, a band called the Sea Hags. And um, the Sea Hags did really, the record that we did uh, actually helped to get them a deal uh, with Chrysalis Records. And so they all of a sudden had a big budget to do the, the major label record. And I was really excited because, hey, they're going to hire me to produce right uh, no no uh, no no uh, they went to LA and hired Mike Klink and who had just done Guns N' Roses and I couldn't compete against that and I realized well I, I wasn't going to get anywhere if I was in San Francisco so I I uh, found a way to to get down to LA and when you move to a new town like if you move to LA you may have had all kinds of experience but you have to start over yeah. so so it was another two years before I actually uh, got my feet uh, into a, a regular studio job. So, and where was that studio in LA? Was that Larrabee? That was Larrabee, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And um, so you didn't have to work your way through the studio system. You, you started actually at a, you know, a reasonable level. No, no. I, I had to start from the way down. I, I had to actually, well, th this is the honest to God story. Of <laughs> so uh, I had been trying to get a job at... Um, Larrabee for a while and um, they finally called me and said hey do you know how to solder and I said yes <laughs> but I didn't really but I wasn't going to say no and um, so the uh, so they said okay you're hired you're going to assist our uh, our tech and you know and so I went up to the shop to meet the tech and it was this big scary guy named <laughs> God. Don Petty, and he said, okay, here's, he gave me a bunch of pins and an Elko and a, and a cable, and he said, and he said, I want you to, uh, to uh, pin this Elko, and I'd never seen any of this before in my life, <laughs> and he gave and me the tool to do it. And, you no, know? and no YouTube to go to, to, uh, right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. 
And so I just kind of carried everything over into the corner and kind of hid and try. And I was trying to open the tool. I was just trying to open the tool because I figured I could make it. I could do it, you know, if I could just figure out how to open the tool. I couldn't. So I went back there about 20 minutes later to Don, and, and I says, hey, would you show me exactly how you'd like this done? And he looked at me, and he goes, you've never done this before. <laughs> and I says, no. And he says, you're fired. And I went, I got fired. My first you actually got fired. They I actually totally fired got fired. Oh, right. I totally got I fired. I thought there was going to be a nice end to it. it was no, like, no. <laughs> it was a joke. Like, <laughs> no, no, I totally got fired. But, no, that they, they thought I had su such balls to actually, you know, say that I could actually do the job that they, they says, you know, Sylvia, we do have this runner job. Would you like to work as a runner? And I'm like, yes. Because, you know, so I did make coffee. I mean, it's, it's that, it comes, every time I do these, these series, the one thing that always sticks out is you just say yes to everything. You have to say you yes. You have to say yes. Yeah. I, the minute you say no, you're yeah. going to make someone very disappointed. And, yeah. You know, it's I, better yeah. to just try to expa explain later. I remember, I, remember, <laughs> I remember being at home and I get a call from the BBC saying, you know how to use an SSL, don't you? And I said, yes. Did never, you really do that? Never had touched one before in my life. <laughs> I was just using some crappy old Alan Heath thing. So I thought, well... I know that the house engineer will be able to use the desk. So um, how hard can it be? You know, I said, you know, I, so I turned up on the, I turned up to the studio in the SSL E series, and the band were doing in about half an hour. And I said to the assistant, "Look, between you and me, I've never used the SSL before. You have to help me through." He goes, "It's my first day." <laughs> so, so it was his. So right, okay. It's, and named Los Williams, who he, he became my assistant for like ten years, and he, I became really good friends. And um, he said, look, we've just got to get through the day. Just hit some buttons and let's get some signals. We just got a couple of mics. So the desk was in some weird mode. We didn't know what was going on. And we just, we just, they just don't show any fear. And we just kind of pressed buttons all day. And we got through the day and the band and then the wiser and the BBC were like, oh, sounds great. Please do some more sessions. So I ended up doing like five years of sessions with the BBC. And made a bill? No, at, um, at, at local studios in South oh. Wales. Although like, oh, I did do a few sessions at Medivale as well, which is always great. But, um, but yeah, I just, you just got to say yes, because and just figure, figure shit out as you go. Yeah. yeah. Just and bluff like, your way I in. didn't get fired, <laughs> amazingly. It was like, I have been fired on a few records since, but it's like, oh. that's a whole other, those are other stories. So, um, so when you went, from, so from runner, how did you go from runner to, was, were you like just around and someone was like, you know, we need an assistant for the session. How did you wangle your way into the actual sessions? Well, it was actually doing the runner part only lasted a couple months. Right. And uh, so I, I did get the opportunity quite a, right away to start engineering. And of course, it was one of those things, you know how to use this stuff in the rack? I'm like, yeah, of course. And, but I learned really quickly. It's yeah. like it was just buying enough time yeah. that I could actually learn how to use it and then um, and there was a lot of big artists working in there um, and uh, um, so one of my first breakthroughs there was um, during the Christmas holiday when um, the engineer Dave Bianco uh, decided he wasn't going to come in because he was going to spend the holiday with his family so I got to um, to mix Aerosmith you know, it's like, and uh, you know, we did, uh, we did, uh, you know, uh, Steven Tyler came in and we uh, recorded parts, and yeah, it was awesome. That's, yeah, that's, that's As an assistant, it was like. Oh, did he know he was passing up Aerosmith? Oh yeah, he knew. Yeah, so it was not the Jimmy Iving thing where he's, he's at home on, on Thanksgiving dinner and. Uh, then he gets the call, comes to the studio, and he, t and, and he said, "Who's it for?" He said, "We can't tell you." He turns up, it's John Lennon. So right. it's like, yeah. So and and, and the, no, uh, I knew it. That, I knew it was going to be, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Or the or the or the John Lecky story. We go to a wedding and says, you know, get gets Nigel Godrich to assist for the for a Radiohead session for the weekend, and uh, and then he ends up producing oh, the next five happened. ten albums or whatever. <laughs> it's just those, those moments. You've got to say yes all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I mean, were you mixing with a band around? Were were were, were you, was it like before you having like Stephen Tyler a hand over your shoulder asking to push the vocal up? Well, that that actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was actually uh, with uh, Rick Rubin was actually. Also, oh, no pressure then, just the vocal. Oh up. no, it was there was oh, there, uh, yeah. And, well, every day at Larrabee was a lot of pressure. I mean, there was yeah. you know um, high pressure stars every day. Um, 
the, the, that's when I got involved with the Prince project because wow. the Prince hadn't worked at Larrabee before and my boss decided to lay that one on me. He says, you know, your job is to make Prince like this place enough that he'll continue working here. And Prince order, uh, had, had booked four days and um, the first day he came in, he looked around the room and he says, well, don't you have a, a big upholstered grandma's chair I could sit in? And of course the studio, you know, of course we didn't have anything like that, but I said, Yes, we do, and I'll just go get it right now. You know, <laughs> and I, I ran out to the lobby and I said, "Somebody give me a truck!" You know, and I, someone threw, threw me the keys. I drove down to Melrose and I bought the first <laughs> antique, you know, chair I could find. Threw it in the back. I came back within 20 minutes while they were still sitting up, and I brought the chair in. And he sat in it, and he wound up booking the place for three years. <laughs> so it worked. It so, worked. So you, the, the studio loved you then? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, they man, loved me. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah, and then and then I really worked hard with yeah. Prince after that. I mean, obviously the Prince sessions, the, the workload for for the for the producers and the engineers is just like it's every story here is just a, it's just an incredible workload, an incredible pressure. I mean, how did how did you manage to deal with that? Well, you can, just to describe what a day was like, because he would book, he had these two rooms at Larrabee West booked, and he had another two rooms at the record plant booked. So four rooms, four engineers, uh, and then he would bounce between rooms. Each room was, you know, uh, writing. He would he would start in one room, um, you know, composing the, the rhythm track. Like I would have a drum machine and a keyboard with a bass patch on it and he would play the drum machine with one hand live, playing the bass line live with the other hand. And of course there's no, you know, uh, uh, quantization at the time, but he was doing, you know, kick, snare, hat, and he would just play it live. And I was recording it and then I would transfer that into uh, Publison Infernal 90. Oh, do you remember wow. this? I do, I do. Okay, this is an old sampler. It was a French made sampler, but it was uh, useful because of it actually had a kind of a long sample um, time. But uh, well, long in comparison to that. Oh, yeah, yeah well, yeah. nothing like now. Yeah. But, but uh, so, we, so he would play a part and he'd say, okay, this is the verse. And he'd play another part and he'd say, this is the chorus. And then I would assemble it while he was bouncing to the, the next room doing the same thing. And then he'd come back and then. On different songs in each room. Different songs in each room. And, and so it would go from uh, writing to recording to uh, doing all the vocals. And he, and he wouldn't want anyone in the room when he was doing vocals, so I'd have. Uh, mic hung uh, hung over the the uh, console, uh, and and then it was an SSL uh, a, a E with a G computer, so wow. it was basically a G, and he would just control everything himself. He was a brilliant engineer. Oh, so you just you just you'd have to leave the room. And I would leave the room, and I'd be right. sitting outside the door right. <laughs> waiting for him. So it would take about maybe it would take three or four hours for him to finish because he would do all the comps and he would do. Uh, layered backing vocals and s slabs of backing vocals, and uh, and then then he would come busting out the door and, and he'd say mix it, you know, and he'd go on to the next room. So, but 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 that was, we would do that twice for two songs every day, in each room. So he was writing, recording, and mixing, eight song at least eight songs a day for decades. So the music that people haven't heard, it's just, it would go on forever. I mean, there's so much music, Prince music, that hasn't been heard. And the, the incredible thing is that the, the labels, he always had a, an issue with the labels because the label wouldn't put out his, enough of his music because he was so prolific that, uh, you know, they, they'd say... Prince, we're not putting out another record. You just put one out four months ago, you know, and he'd come up with a new record. And so he can't, these these albums would continually change. So he would have a, a brand new record finished, mastered, and then come back um, and he'd fuck with it because he'd have to put in the latest new song and, yeah. and you know, change it over and over again. 
So it became a, it came a, um, it became an issue with him between him and the label. But there was a there's a good story about that too. Pray tell. Oh God, <laughs> I've got so many print stories, but this one is a pretty good one. Um, so he was doing that. He, he the, the album was Diamonds and Pearls, and it was finished. It was mastered, and um, but he wanted to take take songs off of it and you know reassemble with a new song he just wrote this new song it was called get off and and he was so hot on this song and i didn't really like this song you know but i wasn't rec i didn't record it i was uh, i was actually assisting um keith cohen who was mixing get off and so i'm sitting in the back of the room and i'm, I'm just you know there in case i'm needed and um keith is mixing and prince is sitting there with keith and um, I, I carry a journal with me, and I'm, so I'm writing in my journal. Um, you know, there's Prince sitting on his purple throne, and he's taking a perfectly good record, and he's ruining it with this stupid song, Get Off. <laughs> and I'm just writing, I'm just like venting, you know, just. And then I look down and I go. And the next thing I hear is. There's Prince sitting on his purple throne, and he turned right to the page, and he was reading it out loud. Prince, I was mortified, and I dove across the room and snatched it out of his hand, and I was just like shaking, you know. And he was laughing. He thought that was so funny. He was. He thought it was so funny, and in fact, he he really became very friendly with me after that. He was much more friendly, and he gave me a lot more uh, opportunity and work and ultimately even asked me to move to to uh, Minneapolis. And yeah, that, I, I, that's something I found out from your BFM interview earlier. So I didn't realize that you'd, you'd actually turned down moving to Minneapolis yeah. to actually stay in LA. I mean, that must have been a, was, that, was it a hard decision or was the workload of Prince so outrageous? He was exhausting to work for. I mean, you know, I'd get calls in the four o'clock in the morning, you know, Sylvia, come to the studio, you know. <laughs> so, but, and it was exhausting, and it was every day, and uh, and then you would you would never know if he was going to show up or, you know, if he had to if he could go home and sleep or whatever. Because so everyone was on. I mean, there was just not a lot of communication. So uh, I was happy to when I got the opportunity to to produce. There, there was no question. I was going to be producing instead of being on someone's, you know, um, pager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I turned uh, I turned Prince down for the job and then I never heard from him again. That was the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did love the story you told yesterday when we were at uh, uh, Wellington about um, you had that you had a, a great mix set up and wait for Prince to turn oh, up. Oh god, can I tell that tell story? Tell the story oh, and then we'll, oh, then we'll okay. move on from Prince, but it's, right. it's, it's well right. worth that. Right. Well yeah. Thanks, you guys, for listening to this story. <laughs> I'm sure they're interested. <laughs> well, this one is a, the, yeah. So, so uh, you know, every time I got an opportunity to mix something, I really wanted to show off my skills, you know. So uh, he gave me a project, a song to mix, um, and it was like one of these uh, seven-minute, long, slower, kind of sexy songs. And it was uh, like a... a Oh baby, what I'm gonna do to you tonight? Kind of what Prince song, you know? And and, uh, and so uh, I uh, I spent all day working on this thing because I I knew you know at some point he's gonna show up and I'm gonna play it for him and he's gonna love it. So it's about seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. I realized if I mix any more, I'm gonna ruin it. So I had to just stop and then sit out, sit in the lobby and wait for him to show up. And, it, you know, I think it was like about 10 o'clock he finally showed up and he came b busting in the front door of the studio and um, and he had a girl with him and he heads into the room and I'm, I'm like, oh, great, I get to play it for him. And he blocks me at the door <laughs> and he says, I won't need you. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so he shuts the door. I'm sitting there outside the door and I hear the, the mix being played. And, and, and and the seven minutes, you know, and then it then it stops, and then it's quiet, and then I'm sitting there, and I'm like, just like, what's going on? <laughs> this is, you know, and then <laughs> and then he comes busting out the door, and straight out the front door, their hair is all messed up, and with a girl, and and I was just like, damn, you know, I spent all day 
it, uh, it, it just to so he could like get off with a, get off with a girl. <laughs> and then I had to go in there and like you know. <laughs> So did, did, did he have any comments on the mix, or was he not, too distracted? Not a word, not, not a, a word. word right, yeah. But it must have been pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing, yeah. it was amazing. So it'd be, really, I'm just, I'm, it'd be really good to sort of have a chat about, about the sessions you do with Rick Rubin, and particularly the Johnny Cash sessions, because they're such iconic recordings, and, and, I, and obviously there, there's, there's so many urban myths about working with Rick Rubin. Everyone hears all these stories about he's never around, and it's like, you know, to me, he's an absolute genius because he just has a wonderful ability to put records together and in so many different styles. So it'd be really good to hear someone who's actually on that session, on any session with him, and what's it like to work with Rick, and particularly what were those sessions with Johnny Cash like? Well, I have to say that first of all, that Rick Rubin is, uh, like you say, he he knows how to put. A record together and it's that's his best skill I think because I, I believe there's three kinds of producers there's the engineering kind of producer uh, which is where I came from basically there's a musician type of producer which is like Pharrell Williams or uh, someone who writes the music and then brings the the talent in to sing and then there's the the fan type of producer and that's what Rick Rubin is because he's not necessarily a technician in any way uh, he knows the equipment that that give you the best results, but he's not in there actually dialing anything. Um, and he uh, uh, it, he's not necessarily a musician. He he has ideas, but is not out there playing any any piano. Or, well, he actually he does play piano with one finger, but we, good too, you know, with one finger. But. Um, so he knows how to put these records together, and he knows how to pick uh, the material. And that's, that's where I was really impressed, because the records that I did with him, the first thing he would do is ask for the artist to come up with as many songs as possible. And it, in, the, in the case of like the Chili Peppers, it would be you know over 100 songs. Give me 100, or System of a Down, 100 songs. And then, of course, if you've got 100 songs to choose from, you're going to distill that down into the best... 15 songs or even 20 songs and that's going to be a great record so uh so he he comes at it as a fan so he's listening to the songs uh with that in mind like what what is the audience going to like and is this sticky enough to 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 uh, go go far or is it controversial enough or is it um breaking new ground and and so, like the, the some of the risks he takes, he took with uh, like System of a Down, which is a band I never thought would ever go on the radio at all, but is brilliant and fun. Um, so back to the question about Johnny Cash, um, the difference between Rick working on System of a Down and Johnny Cash was a, a very uh, stark uh, uh, contrast because. The System of a Down record, he did put that record together. He chose the studio, he chose uh, the equipment, basically he had me come in and work as engineer, and then he kind of would check in every four days just to see how it was going. So he didn't spend a lot of time on that project, even though we were working on the studio in his house. He would come in every once in a while, you know. Um, which was great, because he let us kind of do what we wanted to do, and it was brilliant. It came out, they're such a great band. Oh, it's, it's, it's a yeah. brilliant record, yeah. And so, but with Johnny, and uh, Johnny put, or uh, Rick put this project together with Johnny Cash uh, doing songs that Rick chose, uh, with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers as the backup band. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, and then there were guest artists. There was Mick Fleetwood, uh, Lindsey Buckingham, Carl Perkins, uh, June Carter, Cash, Marty Stewart, and uh, just a, a lot of other people would just come in and add a little bit to it. So every day I was working on this project, and Rick, um, you know, was there every minute. You know, he was there early. He was there before I got there, and he was there right to the end every day. He wouldn't miss any of it. Or was it just because he was just a huge Johnny Cash fan? Huge uh, Johnny Cash and his fan and also a Tom Petty fan and yeah. loves those guys. They were just pals. So, um, 
so yeah, uh, that was a different um, different side of Rick that I saw there. Okay. Is uh, he was very very involved. You just played uh, on the BFM show earlier. You played a beautiful outtake of Tom Petty teaching Johnny Cash. Which what song was it? The, the the Tom Petty song Southern Accents. Yeah, you might want to jump on the BFM site and have a listen because it's a, it's a really incredible. Oh, it was really just an special. outtake on the studio. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, and, and it was just a you know there was moments when Tom Petty is is just going through the chord progression and uh, how uh, how to sing um, the the uh, uh, Southern Accents uh, song and and Johnny actually. Um, did sing that song. I, I'm not sure it made it on the record though. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I guess, in the job that we have, it's those moments that are kind of, all the, all the, the bad sessions we've had to go through over the years, those little moments make the career. They're the, they're the, they're the moments you live that's for. That's why we're doing yeah, it, that's, yeah. right? Is when you, you're in the studio and you're, you can't believe what you're seeing or the music is so in, inspiring that it gives you shivers up your spine. I just love that. Yeah. I crave that, you know. Yeah. It's, and because it's rare, it's special. Yeah. You know, it's just those moments that just. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's still a music that I listen to, you know, 25 years later, and there's moments that that I'll hear it again, and it still gives me the same reaction. Yeah. Isn't that great? I mean, it must be strange now. Now, both Johnny and Tom Petty are gone. It must, it must give it an extra level of poignancy as well for you as you were there on the sessions. Well, even just listening today to that outtake of Tom Petty singing his own song, the Southern Accents, I mean, th there's still a part that when I listen to it now, it just makes me really, you know, sad. Yeah. Because yeah. he's singing about his mom kneeling and praying for him, and it's just like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The power of music. Just, yeah. yeah, the power yeah. of music, and, and the power of music to bring you back to a moment in time. Yeah. It's amazing. I, mean, you know, the, I always compare it to, you know, when, so when you're young and you're on holiday and you hear a song and that song will always remind you of those family holidays and we get to live that as a career. You, we, we have those songs and, you know, I put on records I worked on 20 years ago and it's like, it takes you right back to the studio and the moment and the, and the, and the parties and the, and the craziness and, or the not craziness. You know, just, you just, you, you grab that moment in time and it's, it's lovely to have, it's like a catalogue of your own life. And I think I think it's a great part of being a producer and an engineer. It's just, uh, it yeah, I, I had a big turf out of songs. I went through like crates of dats from the nineties and two thousands. But I should really go through these and sort them out and see if they still play, you know. And um, it was I spent a whole day in the office just playing these songs and I, songs that you just forgot and you recorded them. And then all of a sudden that moment comes back and the people come back. And so, uh, yeah, it's a really yeah. There's been so much music now over. Um the span of 35 years that I, I did put a playlist together of these songs and some, some of them come up and go, hey, I like this. Oh shit, I recorded this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, okay. Um, I think we should probably get into your penchant for unusual recording techniques. But I thought I'd kind of like start it off with the list that I had to send to Paddy here yesterday for the sessions here this week. So, you know, normally it's like, you know, I'd go on well, this compressor and this, this plug and this bit of software and, um, you know, these microphones. And so this was Sylvia's list. Um, a power drill, mains powered, not battery. A packet of Gouda cheese, baby bell is good. <laughs> An old cassette machine with a line out. A desk lamp with a spiral eco bulb. Some cable with crocodile clips on. An old XLR that you're happy to sacrifice, and a crap old guitar with rubbish microphonic pickups. <laughs> did you find them all, Paddy? Did, 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 did you find them all? Oh, he's got them all. Well done. He did, has you get, them all. did you get the cheese? He got. You know, he couldn't find the baby bell, but he got a big cheese, big chunk of cheese. All right, you've checked it out already. Yeah. Well, is, yeah, is it the right but cheese? I think I, because it's a, such a big chunk of cheese, I think we should get some crackers so that after we you can eat. Yeah. So we can share it with the... I'm sure everyone wants to know why on earth you want cheese for a recording session. Would oh, we're you like gonna, to enlighten It's them? not really to eat. The, the, we're only going to use about that much for our uh, filtering. We're going to filter audio through cheese. Would you like to explain to everyone? Okay. And, and what are the, uh, the characteristics of particular cheeses? Okay, I can tell you all about it. <laughs> it's like a master chef. Well, let's see. One... 
I think I was sitting at a lunch table once, and we and I was discussing with some other engineers about how um, you could make a clock out of a potato, a potato clock. Have you heard about I this? I did not know that. Well, apparently, and I don't, I've never done it, but yeah. apparently if you suspend a potato in a certain way and put wires in it or something, I don't know, it, but it generates some kind of power. Right, so you can run a little clock with it. This potatoes is potatoes are really useful, aren't they? Potatoes, right? potato bombs, potato bombs. <laughs> <laughs> so who knew? Well, we, so we were discussing this, and then I was thinking, well, why, you know, if you can, if you can actually power a clock with it, why can't you power, you know, an amplifier, or why can't you filter, or why can't you plug, you know, wires into? Why don't we listen to what a potato sounds like, okay? And then we're like, fuck yeah! <laughs> <laughs> we were a little, having a little too much fun that day, but I t uh, took a speaker cable and cut it in half. So this is a, you know, a speaker cable that you know, typically would take, uh, run from the guitar head into a speaker, right? right? So I cut that and separated the wires and then uh, put two potatoes in line. One was a positive potato and one was a <laughs> negative potato. And and we flipped on the amp and we and, and it worked. And it was like holy shit. <laughs> uh, then uh, but there was a lot of attenuation. But it was a very nice high shelf. So it actually filtered and added something to the sound. So but it wasn't that impressive. So I started experimenting with other things. I thought, well, why not hot dogs? So I put a hot dog <laughs> in there. And then, and it was very flat. It was actually very unimpressive. But it wasn't until the cheese dogs, so you cheese sausage, all of a sudden it was like, oh my god, that's a beautiful blues tone. It was like better than a, uh, than a uh, guitar paddle. And then we were on, right? So why does cheese sausage sound better than regular sausage? Well, it's the cheese. So we went straight for the cheese. And then, and then I experimented with different types of cheeses. I find that Gouda is the best. And, and not to have a positive cheese and a negative cheese, but just, just one, one side of the wire. Um, so, so yeah, so we're going to do a little bit of that experimenting this week. And, and, but the thing is, okay, you take that same circuit and you divert, instead of plugging in cheese, you divert that line to go into kitchen appliances or power tools. Power drills. And, uh, hence the power drill. On the okay, list, yeah. I know it sounds nuts, but seriously, motors are crazy. You run this, the audio through the motor without plugging it in the wall. It's not getting power from the wall. Now you're just getting power from the audio output of the amplifier. And from the audio. And then you get the sound of the audio going through the circuitry of the drill. And then when you hit certain frequencies, the, the drill actually, the, the motor starts. So the drill is running. And so then you get these harmonics, these beautiful harmonics from the motors. And different motors get different sounds. Like you plug in fans, you plug in, you know, blenders and, and dremels. And, and everything has a different character. It's fantastic. I'm so excited about this week's morning. <laughs> I know, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and, and then, uh, but I'm not done. Okay, then light bulbs. Light, that's, that's my next okay, question. light bulbs. So the same circuit, you plug in a light bulb, uh, a lamp, and then you can switch out light bulbs and try different. The light bulb filters are really fun because each type of light bulb has the different filament. If you're using uh, incandescent bulbs, the, there's a the material and then different filament it sounds different. The different material, and the fluorescent bulbs, the the curly eco bulbs sound crazy. They're fuzz, like the best fuzz pedal. Um, and then you can try LEDs. I haven't tried Christmas lights though. Well, can we get Christmas lights? Patty, can you add to the list, please? Christmas, Christmas lights. lights. Yeah, great. All right. Amazing. Yeah. It's very we'll try it. I mean, it's, Anything goes. I mean, why not? I mean, obviously, you know, you're kind of legendary for 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 lots of interesting sonics and different ideas. How did how did that start? I mean, was there just a moment you thought, well, why not try this, or was it just 
accidental or was it just your, the way your mind works? Well, if you're sitting around a table with some people and you start talking about crazy ideas, it's like there's one thing about talking about it, but then I'm just the person that's going to do it. You know, you just go all the way with it. But, but I've kind of done this from the beginning, and I love the idea of actually building into a session something that is memorable, that's different, that you can, you can just say that that session, we did that, you know. So is that how the sort of shooting pianos and the tool session came about? Sure, yeah. I was thinking of uh, when I had the opportunity to work on the Undertow record that I wanted to do something that would really be special and create some outrageously obnoxious sound. What is the most obnoxious sound that we could make for them? And um, so I thought, well, let's take a piano and get a crane and drop it off the side of a building or something, and just crash and record it, and then that would be awesome, right? But um, I, it, I it was. Uh, prohibitively expensive to rent a crane. <laughs> so I did manage to buy two pianos for fifty dollars because they're they're wrecks. You know the the hundred year old piano is uh, unfixable, pretty much totaled, and you can find them relatively easily. So I had a, a couple of them dropped off at the studio, uh, which was Grand Master in Los Angeles, and there was a big stage in the back. So I had them put on the to the stage. And then um, Danny had a shotgun, so we're like, "Wow, well, okay." So we mic'd up the the piano. <laughs> Trust the drummer to have a shotgun. <laughs> it's, like, it's a drummer thing. Yeah, yeah. So we and it was we we mic'd them up, and I put contact mics all over the the uh, soundboard of the piano, and then I had some uh, room mics set up also. And um, and so we shot the pianos, and then I had I bought some sledgehammers, and I made sure everyone had safety equipment. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we uh, destroyed these pianos and recorded all the sounds, and then uh, sequenced them into a a uh, performance piece, basically for the end of the record. And in the if you listen to Undertow, the last song is called Disgustipated, and that is the sound of the piano being destroyed and then sequenced. It's did, very disturbing, actually. Didn't you end up put, did it was did you end up pushing the piano off a cliff as well? Was that? That was a guitar. That was a guitar. Yeah, guitar, yeah, that was a different project, and that was a, a, a sacrificial guitar. It's always good, you know, to, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to. Well, it's not always good to destroy guitars. I can show. <laughs> but I really like the idea of just taking something and saying, okay, this guitar we sacrifice for the record. And then everyone will carve their name in it or add a little artwork to it. And then at the end, you know, everyone's looking forward to what are we going to do with this? And then throw it off the cliff. <laughs> I don't think you ended up using, using the sound of it off, on, on the record, did you? Well, there was that one time when, I th when we threw it off the cliff and it made an incredible sound, but there was no place on the record for it. Ultimately, it didn't work. So some of these ideas actually don't translate and don't actually work in the record but yeah. it uh it's a it, lot of fun it, well you know it, these are it's more about the experience yeah. than it is and i think that the excitement and the anticipation is imprinted into the music that you record so uh there's a joy that is uh is uh i think that it is there yeah. that you can hear. so obviously you carry that kind of ethos through to the places that you record, and you know, I often ask people in these seminars, you know, who what's your favorite studio? You know, and they sort of say, "Ah, your room's great." Or, I mean, Grandmaster sounds like really because Gil was talking about Grandmaster yesterday. So you should be a porn studio. Grandmaster, yeah, yeah, right? but yeah, they, they, yeah. they did shoot a lot of porn there. Yeah, so date, yeah. date. My and, assistant actually was a sec. Yeah, you know, he was like a, a an know, extra in the porn. An film. extra in the porn. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Gil did the, Gil did the food fight you said because it's a benefit Gil was like I love, I love that studio and then you reminded him when it rained the rain just came through all the roof and yeah it was crap yeah so it was like some Sound City was crap I mean it was like oh. I mean it's like I think everyone has a sort of like rose tinted glasses for Sound City because of the film I mean my thoughts on the film were I 
kind of wish David had bought the studio and left the desk in it. It's like, you know, it's, I mean, this garage was great. It was lovely to see the desk in this garage. And, and, but I kind of felt you should have saved the studio. But was it not a great, was it not the legendary place that it's portrayed in the film? It was definitely legendary, but um, the, the, it, was, it was very hard to work there, Sound City, because, uh, and, I, and I had all my equipment in the B room, I, I, and then, you know, the, the legendary Dave Grohl console was in the A room at the time. But, um, so I spent a lot of time in this, in this studio, and the, when I first moved into the B room, there was like one single naked light bulb hanging over the desk, and it was like, can I... You know, can we do something about this? And they're and they're like, no. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so the management and I really kind of busted, you know, heads yeah. together. So, uh, so one weekend when no one was uh, uh, when no one when the management wasn't there, I just changed the whole lighting and I changed. There, there was the couch that was in the room we had a cat living in it, and, <laughs> and it was so disgusting. It was disgusting. So I pushed it out into the street and I replaced it. And then there was one weekend when I, I mean, the place was just a wreck. So um, I, I would fix things on the weekend. So I fixed all the broken stained glass. And one weekend I even had um, the crew, uh, the, the runners help me um, remove everything from the manager's office. And we <laughs> replaced all the broken ceiling tiles and painted the whole thing and put in new everything, you know, and like completely redid her office and then put everything back exactly the way it was. And and then we took bets to see if she would notice. <laughs> <laughs> and it took, a, took her a while to notice and then she called me immediately and was like, oh my God, my boys, you wouldn't believe what they did for me. And I was like, oh, Siobhan, that's so great. <laughs> and then... Four hours later, she called me. How dare you come into my office? <laughs> she found out. But we used to tor torture her. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry, Siobhan. Uh, but being streamed is it right now? <laughs> okay, all right, good. I'll just tell I'll, you I'll, guys. I'll get Chris to edit it before. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so uh, Joe Breezy and was the assistant there, and and. Um, and we all got together and put a, a speaker up in the ceiling above her office. And then we would play the sound of a cat meowing. <laughs> like a kitten. Like, yeah. And we did that for weeks. And she was just like, oh my god, somebody find that poor cat. Everyone was in on it except for her. So, so they would go up on the roof and, you know, smoke a joint and come back down. And like, I couldn't find anything. <laughs> and, <then laughs> and so after two weeks, we were finally like, oh God. So we changed it to a dog park <laughs> and then a train. <laughs> and she figured it out. But uh, yeah, we used to torture her. So were you glad to actually, to, um, yeah, well, why did you move from LA and set up Radio Star in Weed, which is a great, the best named place ever? Did you go there because it was called Weed, or was it? <laughs> um, now it was just—it just turned out that that's where I wound up in a place called Weed, which was great because musicians love weed, so they—it was not that difficult to get them. To so come. that was your marketing campaign. Yeah, it's like, come to <laughs> musicians weed. love weed. Come to Weed. So, because yeah. you had the old theatre there, didn't you? I bought an old theater um, uh, when I decided to leave Los Angeles. I looked for a space that I could set up, uh, and um, the acoustic space was already there, you know. And in fact, I didn't really make a control room uh, because I really enjoy like open room recording. So we just took out the the seats in the back of the theater and set up the Neve back there and uh, started recording immediately. And it was brilliant. It was awesome. So you ended up with like was it five studios there eventually? We started with the one in the theater and then built a mix room up in the balcony and then bought the adjacent buildings and put in three more studios. So there was five studios total and seven residences. So I'd have bands coming in from all over the world. and It was an incredible place. There was a, like a community kitchen and 
there was always someone, you know, it was like a, we would have a Thanksgiving meal with, uh, with someone from Israel cooking and um, the Japanese crew and uh, from the Canada and uh, it was just every, people from everywhere. It was fantastic. So did you have lots of engineers working for you at that time? And I did. I had uh, you, a whole You became Prince. You were rotating studios. Well, I learned a lot from yeah. both Rick Rubin and, and yeah. Prince, who did this kind of uh, circulating of, of uh, projects, you know. So I would bounce between rooms, and I had a brilliant crew and would uh, employ engineers that had the skills to, to produce. I wanted that. So, uh, and I would share uh, co-production with, with everybody. Yeah. And um, so we, we cranked out at least, oh, it was a, yeah, there was a lot of music that went through that studio. Yeah. So you moved from Weed now, and you've, you're set up in, is it near Medford? Or was Medford the yes, new airport? Yes, I moved up the road a bit. Now I'm in Ashland, Oregon. I had to kind of sell out because I had a divorce. So I'll do it every time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, I'm out of weed. <laughs> out of weed. And now I live in Ashland, and, and I bought a church. And now I have uh, the studio, the Neve is in the church. And all the you know, only one stu well actually there's two studios you know it's gonna start all over again. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to come and visit. You, yeah, please yeah. come and visit. It's a great place. So um. So you you you're legendary for kind of finding interesting places to record. I I, I heard recently you were in in a disused tube station in London, and um, so what is your thinking behind it? And 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 at what point in the project do you actually decide to go to a, an unusual recording environment? Well, here's, here's what I discovered when I, when I first moved into this theater, is that just setting up gear in the back of a room without any soundproofing or room treatment, you could make hella good records in there, you know? So why are you limited to working in a studio at all? So I started working wherever I felt like it, and and the as important as the equipment that you're using, um, the environment that you work in is so inspirational to the performance. So if you put you know if you have a singer singing in a vocal booth, uh, you're going to get one type of performance. If you have that same singer singing the same material in a cathedral, you're going to get an entirely different performance. So uh, taking that in mind, now I'm, I'm not limiting myself to just working in, um, in a studio environment because I'll, I'll consider that the, the space that you record in will, uh, is as important as the gear you're using, I think. So, uh, so yeah, if you want a, a really uncomfortable sound, sounding performance, like, you know, if you're, uh, you can you can record in the crawl space under a house, you know. Put your singer down there. <laughs> see what you get. You know, uh, I've hung singers upside down. Uh, uh, Is some of that just punishment for them being being you know being annoying on the session? Sometimes so, that's yeah, just so I, I punishment. Did that before. I did have a singer. Did you? Well, yeah. Well, I I had a singer and um, I I I I got it. I said, if I clean the toilet tap, will you sing down it? And he said, he, and he, and he, and he's like looked at me kind of strange, because we were trying to be experimental. So and he did. So I, I cleaned the toilet, up, taped a piece at end underneath the bowl, and I got his, had his head in the toilet, and we, and that's that's the vocal on the record. I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I want to do great. that. It was great, and I mean, you know, it was a nice little bit of the bathroomy reverb on it. It was, it was cool, and it was really funny to see with his head in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and he was really, to be fair, he was game for it. We did all kinds of that, you know. I, but, the, the the mic in the in the talk back mic in the in the old Alan Heath was great, so I often get you know, get him to sing with a finger on the talk back button and do the lead vocal into the and just you know just yeah so that, that's that, good. that was great and you get all that nice tape compression. And um, how clean is the toilet here? <laughs> well, if Emily's cleaning it, it'll be really clean. Okay. Uh, I've given yeah. So what? All right. Yes, I couldn't sort of match it. Idea. Right <laughs> um, you did a you did a record in the uh, cooling towers of a, a nuclear power plant as well. Yeah, there was a nuclear. It was a a, a nuclear 
power plant that had never gone online. It was built in the 80s and then abandoned before they actually put any radioactive material in it. So these humongous cooling towers were there on site and uh, I found out about it uh, and brought a band called Thunder Pussy in and set them <laughs> in, the, in the cooling tower and we and I brought in a uh, Behringer X32, right? And because there was shore, shore power, and so there was a, a way to power this rig. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I did close miking and then some far away miking. And the, it was crazy reverb. But because of the close miking, you know, it was it, it, in the mix, it was easy to manipulate and actually make it sound decent. And, and how was the um, how was the London Underground station? That must have been well. That was a challenge. First yeah. of all, to get permission to go to the to do anything in the London Underground. So it was an old disused station. This was an old disused station, but for for a while I was uh, negotiating with the TFL on how I was going to get access because apparently you know you know the the loudspeaker when it says mind the gap. Uh, they own that recording, and if right. you use it, it's 5,000 pounds. <laughs> That's right. So, but they, they make money on everything. So, um, so this to get into the Aldwych station, the price was outrageous. It was 1,000 pounds an hour. And, and I finally got permission, and I did have the budget for one hour. So, but it's like a half mile underground, you know, it's like a stair, stairs uh, going all the way down, no no elevator and no power on the platform either. So, but we did get permission and we uh, had uh, an escort and we packed up pack backpacks and I had two, I had an engineer help me because there were two platforms. So uh, we split up duties, we, one platform, we had a dead train on it and it was really super creepy. And we did guitar recording in there, and then the other platform I just set up with the drums, and we did drums on the other platform. And I used these, um, because there's no power, I, uh, one rig was with a laptop and an um, interface, you know, a USB interface. Is, and the is, other that, one. is that where you run into Pro Tools authorization problems, because there's no yes, Wi-Fi? Yes, I'm sure, you know, yes. Yes, I have a subscription to, to <laughs> to Pro Tools and... The days oh, you hate Avid is right. Oh there. my yeah. God, so we're down there and then so the, you, you can't use your Pro Tools because there's no Wi-Fi. Oh, so we used Reaper actually on the platform. But the other platform I used uh, device, sound devices, which is a portable unit, uh, battery operated, which now I'm just a huge fan of. It's a standalone unit which is a multi-track recorder, and it has eight uh, mic pre's. And it's of high quality, it ha you know, has uh, uh, EQ and compression, and, uh, uh, and yeah, and it's a standalone, but you can also use it with a USB cable to run uh, as an I.O. for your Pro Tools. So it's a really fantastic thing. It's called Sound Devices. It's a Mix 10. Uh, and then you can also link two of them together so you can have 16. So it's quite a powerful system then. Yeah. yeah. 16 uh, mic pre's. Yeah. Portable. Just so, so my next. The perfect Sylvia Massey. Oh setup. my God. Yeah. Yeah, watch out. I think of this project I'll be doing ne uh, next year will be um, a, seri a punk rock artist uh, that will be recording um, gorilla style with my sound devices, um, uh, recording gorilla in um, the great art museums of the world. <laughs> it's gonna be so great. We're probably gonna get kicked out. Fuck yeah! <laughs> On video! So have, have, you, have you sort of, so we even, I should probably should, we should probably didn't tell anybody, if it's gorilla style, we should probably not announce which which art galleries you're gonna go to. Oh, they're the good ones now, yeah, yeah. All the big, all the big ones, all, all the, the big ones. ones. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be fascinated. I, well, yeah, I hope so. Or, um, or you'll be arrested. Oh. Either that. Yeah. So maybe maybe put some of the budget aside for bail money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so while we're while we're not talking tech stuff, we should probably talk about microphones because you're in the process of writing a book on microphones at the moment. 
and the excitement in your face when we went to Radio New Zealand yesterday. In fact, you, Clint Murphy, and and Gil, I wandered in, and you're all staring at this wall of microphones, and it was like, um, yeah, it was it was quite yeah. quite, quite a moment. It yes, was, it was also very excited. Uh, yeah. I was uh, contracted by Hal Leonard to make a to write a book on uh, vintage microphones, which is just about the greatest thing ever. So I am having to choose the 600 most important microphones, you know, <laughs> right? It's really hard to narrow it down. You know how many microphones there are in the world? So, uh, so I've been going out. I went to Neumann. I met uh, the president of Neumann. I went to Gefell, and they have a little museum there at Gefell. And I've got all those stories, too, and took a lot of photographs. Um, and I went to the Shure headquarters in um, Indiana, in, where is it, Illinois, by Chicago. Uh, anyway, so I'm doing a lot of research on mics. The, the mics at Radio New Zealand blew my mind because they, I've only heard about these mics, but they, there's a company called Brush. Right. Have you heard of a company I've called never, Brush? Never these are Brush mics. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what does that say? Does that say Brush? And then I was like, they're, they're like, uh, we're going to take your photo now. I'm like, no, 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 not me. The mic. I need it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that, that's going in the book there. Uh, brush mics. Big bottle mics. Oh. So have you found some real gems on your sort of Eastern European travels? Yes. There's so many more mics than I ever imagined. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, so it's going to be a great book. It will feature the 600 mics, uh, quality photos, and uh, stories, uh, stories about collectors, about uh, manufacturers, uh, about the uses of certain mics, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra's mics, uh, this kind of thing. It's going to be great. Yeah. I was... Um when I was at uh, ICP in Brussels, they've got an incredible, they've got a whole mic room that's about the size of that, about the size of that control room, just full of microphones. And they've got, um, they've got mics that were used in the Third Reich, they were used for, for, for speeches at Nazi rallies. And they have like the, the gold, the eagle and the swastika on them. The CMD and, Yeah, they, and they, they look a bit like the bottle mics for the, yeah. and, um, and it was like, Incredible to like use them, but also quite freaky and weird because of the, the history behind them. But mic history kind of like traces, you know, that is kind of traces world history in a way from when microphones were first developed, and, and and also the way that you know people use microphones because they tend to be off, you know, people tend to use them off mic rather than you know real close up like we do nowadays. So it's just well, that development. I, of the I don't quite understand the fascination with mics, like that someone could be so crazy about mics to collect hundreds and like I. I'm sorry, I have a problem with mics, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, really, right? What's so special about these? Why are they special? I don't know. But, uh, yes, I love mics. <laughs> mics and, mics and, I saw snare drums were starting to be mine. This has become a bit of an addiction. Yeah, it's always like, like mics or snare drums or, yeah, it's always, there's always, like, guitar, I know a lot of guitarists who have a real problem with, you know, why buy one Fender Jag when you can buy three kind of thing? It's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite, like, it's know, quite it, addictive. It's a, it's a bit of a, um, uh, there's a bit of, uh, uh, some mics are overrated, I guess you could say. I, I think the best mic made is a Shure SM58. And, and Gil thought the same as well. Yeah. But Clint obviously disagreed hugely because you see his face when he, you, oh, he you was, and Gil were waxing lyrical on 58s and 57s. But they are, they're, they're really great all-purpose microphones and they're not expensive, you know. Right, and you can use them for everything. You can yeah. use them. I was working with the Smashing Pumpkins once with Rick Rubin producing and we lined up uh, 10 different microphones to try with Billy Corgan's vocals uh, before beginning. And we had a Telefunken Elam 251, we had an M49, we had a U47, 67, 87, a 414, a C12, C12A, you know, we had all these brilliant German and Austrian mics, and then we had uh, uh, Shure SM58 and a 57. 
and just for the hell, the hell of it. And then we recorded the same verse on different tracks with each mic. And the 58 won. Yeah, the 58 yeah. won. It was, uh, there was no, no question about it. Plus, if you can, you can have a mic that the artist can hold. And, and you can do control you, room recordings. Right, yeah. control room recordings. I mean, just, just the fact that the artist can hold it and, and you're going to get a, a better performance. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in 58. I did a whole Max Repeated album with all the vocals on 58 in the control room. In the control room. James is cigarette in his one hand, Mike in the other, backing vocals, lead vocals, everything. The monitor's blasting. No headphones. Yeah, just, the only problem we had is when we moved studios from the band's own studio in, in Wales to, to Grouse Lodge in Ireland, and because James would sit at the back of the couch on the back with a cigarette, but the couch at Grouse Lodge is way further back, <laughs> so we had to work out the time. We measured it and did all the time delays between the monitors, so because he was just singing, it was really out of time with the track, so we had to do that. So that was the only difference, but it was... The whole record was just 58 in the control room. Sitting down. Sitting down, cigarette. It just has one of those voices. And he's got a read aloud voice. It's great. The proximity effect's amazing and it just sounded really good. So, And, you know, we never told the, Tom Elmhurst to mix the record. We never told him what the mic was. And he was like, oh, this sounds great, you know. And at the end, it was like, oh, it's, do you realize we did it all with the 58? And he was like, really? It didn't have to do anything to it. Bit of top end and that was all, you know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, Couple more questions before we do um, before we throw it out to, to questions from everybody. Um, do you do you miss tape? Do you miss and, and if you do, what do you miss about it? Working to tape. Well, I've I've gotten so used now to just recording digitally that I don't miss it so much. Right. But I do miss the limitations that it imposed and and the fact that you would have to make decisions uh, because you couldn't. Uh, continue to record. You'd have to combine tracks early, uh, so that that I, I miss uh, because uh, well, mostly because of the mixes that I get now um, I have too many tracks, and they're they so other people don't sum mics together anymore. Do you do a lot of summing still, even, even I do. in DAW? I do, yeah. but then yeah. maybe I'm old-fashioned, I guess. I think there's a lot to be said. You know, I think, I think tape is a state of mind as, as, as much as a recording format. You can apply all the things you do to tape to, to any DAW, you know. Don't do too many tracks of vocals, you know. Just do five tracks of vocals and drop in any mistakes so every track of vocals you've got is good. You know, on tape, every, every track was precious. So you'd use it to its fullest advantage and make sure there wasn't just 50 takes with like rubbish wrong vocals and bad bits on you know should you make sure you drop in all you know so you have five really good tracks of stuff you can come from and and um yeah and summing guitar sounds and making committed early on and you know knowing that you would you know you, you're all screwed on track one you couldn't really put a kick drum on it because there was in case somebody nicked the tape and so but i think it's you know i think a lot could be learned from like you know i did loads of records on 16 track and loads on 24 track and and um and I, I just think it's just that ability to, and the, the just make decisions going down to tape. And if you're going to commit guitar sounds, commit all the pedals and everything, leaving too many options to the end, I think is it's um you just don't you lose track of what the sonic image of the record should be. I feel. I mean, maybe I'm old. Well, I am old too, but it's I'm not too. I am old. <laughs> and um, and I, I just but I think I think the state of mind of working with tape is a really you know. Well, one thing I could say about it is making decisions early and uh, it allows you to make the decision because if you hand these sessions over to someone else, um, they're less likely to fuck it up, you know, because if someone else mixes it and you, you don't make the decisions um, for them, then you, who knows what you're going to get. And you'll still do a lot of mixing, aren't you? I do a lot of mixing. Yeah. Are you, are you, uh, do you still do any test mixing or are you pretty much in, in the box these days? I do both. I, uh, I mix it uh, entirely in the box and then uh, when I get a chance I'll do uh, hybrid mixing so that I'll, I'll have um, stems come out on a, on a desk, maybe 16 channels, 8 stereo pairs. Uh, you know, and then I'll just have the faders at zero. But being able to bring it out on the desk and have that last step analog allows me a couple things. I have more headroom, for one thing. Uh, and then I can use the rack uh, 
EQ and compression, which I really love. Yeah. Yeah. Do do you so you're using is it, you use do you use Neve for for that? I do. So yeah. you're using only use a summon mixer essentially. Yes, uh, but then now I have a, a, a I have another little console, a loop trotter, which I'm going to use as the sum. Right. Yeah. So uh, I do like having the last step being analog, analog summing. Cool. Well, I think we should probably. I'm sure there there's so many questions that people want to ask. Who would who would like to who would like to kick it off? Come on, don't be shy, everyone. You you know you're going to ask them eventually. Really? No one. Yes, yes, <laughs> sir. First hand up. Um, I'll come to you in a sec. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, um, just based on the thing you talked about earlier, which I was going to ask something different, but I'm really fascinated by the idea you talked about of going to like, all sorts of places to record cliffs, all of that. And I guess one of my questions is, I'm assuming it's both ways, but would it be you know the part and you think, or we should go do it here, or are you going that place will get a great performance? Is it a mix? Is there a specific example of the other way? Like you hear a part and go, hey, this shouldn't be in the studio. This should be. Oh. Good. Well, a lot of times um, a, there will be a song that if if I'm if I'm able to create the dynamic of big small big, small, you know, and then I'll, I'll do that with the room on the drums or some other instrument. So, because uh, I love this kind of contrast, uh, like, a, you know, a, a part of a song to, to have even, even a bridge where you open a door and, and there's a completely different scene, you know, uh, sonically. Uh, so, uh, a lot of times there will be that, that, that's where it starts. Um, but on the other hand, there's sometimes where I'll be in a city working with a group and then they tip me off on something that they have access to and I'll be like, well, I don't know what we're gonna do. We're gonna do something. Let's figure out something we can record there and we'll, and we'll do that. Like uh, this, this Czech project that I finished recently with Adrian T. Bell. Uh, his name is Adrian T. Bell, and he's in Prague, and he's got a friend who's a bell ringer <laughs> at, the, at the castle. At the it seems castle. so logical, right? I know, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, why don't we record the bells in the cathedral, you know, and the Prague castle, you know? And we had access to that, and we did. We found a place for the bells on the record. We actually had to create a place for it, and it was awesome. <laughs> so, yeah... I, I would recommend if you get an opportunity to to try this kind of recording, just whatever goes. If you if you have access to an unusual place, figure out what you're going to do there. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. And then tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Do you have a question? Oh, um, and and we'll bring the uh, just so we get some audio for um, for, the, for the for the video as well before we edit all Sylvia's stuff out. What? This is on video. Yeah, we'll, 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 it's not going out live, so we can edit some stuff okay. out. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. I'll give, I'll give you, I'll give you final cut, so good. Okay. Oh, um, just a very quick question, the, the Prince, where, what period was that? What ah, years? It was uh, 89 through 91, or 88, somewhere in there. It's pretty foggy, but it was the Batman soundtrack, oh, really? okay. uh, New Power Generation, yeah. Graffiti Bridge and Diamonds and Pearls. So that that working between the four rooms, did any big known songs come out of that process? Yeah, the Cream. Uh, oh, tons of stuff. Plus, he was uh, also writing and um, uh, and producing songs for other artists at the same time. So there was um, uh, this. Kate Bush project. Yeah, you, project. Play, you played that on, on BFM some, tonight. Yeah. I think they were quite shocked when you played a, a Prince and Kate Bush outtake. I didn't yeah, even know they'd worked together. I, I was yeah. certainly thrilled by it. it and was, it was it it's like some of the Kate combinations of, of artists. That, that George Clinton was one artist that Prince collaborated with. Uh, uh, or actually, it was like here, you know, Prince did it. <laughs> uh, Paula Abdul. Um, yeah, so it was this era. There was a lot of different artists 
plus all the music uh, but from Dimes and Pearls it was uh, the song Cream, Get Off, all, those, all the music from Diamonds and Pearls was done in this particular way. And not only that, but there was a really unusual thing that he would do to kind of step up production, because this was like a machine. So he would take songs from the archive, from um, the revolution, uh, older songs, older Prince songs, and he would have us make seven copies of, of a master. He, you know, they would ship them in, we'd make seven copies, and they'd go out to different rooms. And now Prince would come in, and instead of rewriting all the rhythm parts, he would just use it from an old revolution track, and he would keep all the, the percussion, and maybe even the bass line. I mean, you, if you listen carefully to uh, songs from that era, you might find that, um, that there's several of the same song, same bass line, same rhythm parts, on, on several different songs, and he would just change all the vocals and uh, and, and the guitars and uh, backing vocals. So, um, speaking of parts that have gone to the songs, the flute loop then get off. Yeah. Is that a sample, or did he bring someone in to play it? And if it was a sample, was he doing a lot with samples? Because he's not sort of known as a sample guy, he's known for... Oh, his, that was plays the thing. Seven, plays 27 instruments guy. I can't remember, I'm sure it was a sample. I can't remember uh, where that came from, though. Well, was he using a lot of samples at the time? Cause, yeah, cause well, so he's not we were using a Poubusson, you know, it was there was a lot of uh, New Jack Swing happening at the same time, so there was the I guess, I guess. orchestral hits, that kind of stuff, and, and then he would grab his own vocal bit and, and repeat it. And again, a lot of that was actually recycled stuff from old Revolution oh, yeah. records, yeah. too. Yeah. Were you using any of the sort of like um, the early sort of sample systems like Synclaviers or, or, or Fairlights or because that was right in that period that's when the, sort of the, the early Akai's samplers and stuff were coming in. I mean a lot of guys were getting rid of their sort of half million dollar Synclav systems and spending a few thousand on a, on, a, on a sample that had a bit more memory and stereo outputs you know it was like it was, I think it was quite a transition during that period. Yeah, we weren't using the Fairlights or the Synclavier. Right. No, but we were using the AMS sampler. Uh, put this, yeah, right? the early snare samplers. The, what the was AMS. it, the 1580? Or yeah, yeah. And the, uh, the Pubisan, yeah. yeah. And, the, and then the H3000, which was like a revolution at yeah. the time. It's, it's really hard to, exp to sort of let people who record now know how hard it was to do things back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Interest maybe worth telling that really interesting story you told about um, tuning on Johnny Cash vocals, right. yeah. which was like the amount of work that went involved in that. Right. So you can imagine with a at the time there were no Pro Tools and we were recording on analog tape with Johnny Cash and his vocals. Some of it he was learning these songs, so he wasn't getting the melodies right in some of it. I didn't want to completely iron out his his vocal parts, but had to correct some wrong notes. So uh, the only way to do that was with harmonizers, which were, you know, uh, uh, tedious to use. So we would, I would have to route the vocal from one track to another through uh, the H three thousand harmonizer and set it uh, to uh, the to harmonize. Uh, I'd find the right pitch and then punch that word in and out, and then go to the next word, and then find the right pitch, and then punch it in and out. And so it would take a long time to correct these uh, vocals. Yeah. And you Kid, had to have a good machine to punch, yeah. too. Kids today don't know they're born, do they? <laughs> it's I know, all it's so, so much yeah. easier now. Yeah. Just trying to get SMPD and FSK codes to work. And uh, I remember the first MIDI uh, session I did was like eight, 82 probably, and there was like a like a, a Juno 6 with like a DSB to MIDI interface and a DX7, and just the fact you could play the two keyboards off, two sounds off one keyboard, it was like, this is the most amazing thing ever, you know, and it was just like, it was so basic, but it was like, but, and, but nothing, and trying to get anything to sync up was always a nightmare, and um, just to have an FSK code, if you're in the pre, in the pre, in the pre before SIMD was affordable, Having to go to the start of the song every time you wanted to sync a drum machine up to that, the end of the song. The Allison, We've got this L dub at the end, and you have to sort of yeah. go all the way to the start, and it was like, it was, I remember that. And you get there, and there'd be a glitch on the table, something like a kink, you know, there'd be a kink in the, on the, in the code, and it would drop out. And yeah, we keep talking about the good old days, but actually, it wasn't, it they was weren't that good. Fuck tape. It was really. It, it, what, when people. 
waxed lyrical about the romance of tape. I'm like, you never <laughs> recorded on tape. You know, you have a beautiful piano part and all you get is <laughs> and a little bit of piano and it's like, oh no. Yeah, it wasn't that great. But it was, but, you know, it was good trying to make the stuff work and you know but there is something when when you uh what I, I do like to do with analog when i get a chance is is uh there's a 16 track studer a80 at the studio i work at in dresden and uh, i'll track drums on that i'll track drums and then transfer it straight into pro tools because it just adds a nice thump you know but uh, as a processor yes there's, a 16, okay. there's no 16 track head block at the, in the machine here. Oh, really? I think there might, is there a penny? I always wondered, obviously. <laughs> I think that there might be a 16 track head block at the machine in there. What are you saying? Oh, yeah, just that might be nice. To, do we bust the tape out again? I think so. Do we have is there even a spare tape here? Do we want to waste time on that? Or is it Steve Albini <laughs> bought all the world's tape cheese. stock up? <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any more questions for Ant? Uh, Hey, Sylvia. Um, thanks for coming down again. It's yeah. really great. Um, I know through a lot of the interviews and stuff you've written uh, in prior years, you've talked a lot about how you will work with vocalists to get a performance out of them and be that, you know, creating a space around them and a, mo a, a mood or a vibe. Um, does anything come to mind, like something crazy that you've done with that or anything you're particularly proud of? Oh, yeah, so many things. Uh, uh, you know, what I try to do with a singer who is a little uptight is I'll try anything to distract them from constantly worrying about their throat. Usually singers get sick right away uh, the day before they start their vocals. <laughs> Isn't that true? Psychomatic singer disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, it's to be expected. So when I, before uh, we are going to do vocals, even two, a couple days before we start vocals, I'll tell the singer, please get sick. I just like, go ahead. I'm giving you per permission, go ahead and get sick. And they're like, what? I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Smoke a bunch of cigarettes, stay up all night, drink a bunch of whiskey, just wreck yourself, okay? Please get it over with right now. And then they, and then they usually are fine. That's that. a great, I've never thought of doing that. Yeah, <laughs> just psych them out and then they're, they're, they don't get sick. But uh, yeah, so I allow them to get sick. And then, um, and then when we're working together, I work usually, if I'm using the Neve or in, in wherever I'm recording, I'll have the singer standing right next to me as I'm running Pro Tools. We're in the same room together, we'll both be wearing headphones, and the mic will be right there, and they'll be right next to me. And that way, there's not speaking through the glass, which I think it really gets uh, singers kind of upset. Uh, because they, they, you know, you, you have to have some kind of, they have to trust you somehow. Yeah. Um, so if, if you're just communicating with them directly, then it's just a much better situation, I find. Um, and so uh, I'll, uh, sometimes if they're not getting a part, then I'll have them, I'll start, I'll, I'll start giving them jobs to think about, things to think about other than singing. So, okay, okay, that was a pretty good take, okay. Now I want you to express yourself with your hands, okay. Sing the same thing except every word. I want you to pretend you're Italian and you're expressing yourself. <laughs> and uh, so then they do this and then, and then I'll interrupt them and if they're not doing it, I'm like, I'll be waving my hands, and, come on with the hands. And then suddenly they're not thinking about this and then I'll give them more jobs. And I'll, I'll say, okay, now imagine uh, okay, well, a good one, actually, is to tell the singer to smile, even if the song is about sadness. Smile anyway, smile. I want to see the teeth, because if you smile, you instantly have a brightness in your voice, and it's like an EQ, automatic EQ, so make the singer smile, even if it's a miserable song, and then they're thinking about, oh, i got to do this, and i got to use my hands, okay, and then... You know, uh, and then they, you know, pull the ear off if you're if you're having a tuning problem. Then okay, now you get to pull your ear, your headphone off of one ear, so you can listen to yourself this way. And then um, I, I'll just give them. Uh, it gets ridiculous sometimes. I have them stand on one leg, <laughs> uh, or if sometimes I'll have them stand on a chair, and that completely gets them out of their head. You know, because they're terrified about falling, so they're suddenly they're. Thinking. But then, 
uh, you give them all these jobs, and then then they if something happens to them, they get loosened up, yeah. and then it, it it really honestly improves the performance, and uh, and uh, I find it it works really well. When I when I'm tracking, I'll usually I usually have the singer. Um, uh, I'll I I do a very specific way of tracking in Pro Tools where I'll create uh, 20 tracks. I want to see all the tracks all the time, and I'll have the comments window open, the comments um, column uh, available, so I can make notes as we're recording. And I'll do two full takes, top to bottom. This is so I have a visual idea of where all the words are. And then I'll go through, and uh, if I'm not getting uh, good good performances, well, uh, I'll just I'll get I'll get pieces anyway. I'll go and get the verse. Uh, I'll do three more takes of that verse. It's, you know, three takes of the chorus, three takes of the next verse. You know, and I can see everything all layered and uh, on the screen. So that, and then as I'm recording. I'm making notes in my comments window, like, and I have a little set of codes, like verse one, the first phrase of verse one is called V1A. Okay, if that's good, I put a V1A star. If it's not good, I won't make a mark. Okay, so that pretty soon the, the, uh, the comments column is full of little marks that say like C1BC star, you know, BR, which is bridge, Star, 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 you know, on this tent. So, uh, honestly, by the time we're done with the song... So the comp is pretty much done. I, my comp is already done, because I, I'll be comping while we're recording the last little bit. I'll just already be moving my bits according to my notes. So, comping is done. Um, and, it, and then I, I'll detail it later, but it's really easy to do comping that way. And, then, um, and, and as I'm giving them more jobs and... You know, and then I'll get the parts that I need. I need this one word, okay, I'm gonna, I am gonna. want them to give me the expression on that one word, okay, then I got it, okay. Boom. You know, so that's how I do vocals anyway. I so hope that was interesting. So now on your next session, you have singers standing on chairs, and <laughs> yeah, there'll be a whole sort of like, there'll be lots of sort of, um, eight, uh, sort of ATC claims of singing, oh, I fell off a chair when I was on a vocal. <laughs> It's all right, we're all covered here, so, we, so we, all, we all pay into it, yeah. It's not like America. Yeah, we get, yeah, yeah we, we pay in, yeah, we pay a bit of money in, and we get, we get broken Oh, that makes me feel leg. so much better. So if you, if you get anyone standing on a chair this week, I was, week, Well, I was getting wow. a little nervous about what we'll be doing over the next couple of days with the electricity and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's pretty, it's, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, it's health and safety's not, it's not a big thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jump off bridges and you know it's all kind of jet boating. Oh, that's right, you are yeah, jumping off a bridge. Crazy shit, yeah, yeah. There was some questions over here. Yeah. Oh, where were you going? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I'll come back. I'll, I'll come back to you. Sorry, did I just steal your question? No, no, it's good. <laughs> okay, I had a question about um, bass. Um, how would you go about recording bass for like alternative rock or any sort of interesting ways you go about it, say for like stuff like Tool and Melvins, et cetera, et cetera? What's some interesting things you might do there? Well, for bass, uh, my, my favorite bass setup uh, is going to be a Fender Jazz bass into a 70s era SVT Ampeg head with an 8x10 cap. Now, if you don't have that, there's other things you can do. You know, Gil talked about a really great idea yesterday that I'm gonna try. This is not what I typically do, but if you get a splitter pedal, split it into your standard bass rig that you've got, but then also put it into a Marshall head and a four by 12 cap. Mm -hmm. And then you get the middle, mid, mid range growl out of that, that uh, the Marshall and then you get your low tones from your, uh, your bass rig, and then also keep a DI also, and keep that separate, it's because your, your subs are gonna come from that. But a, a lot of times, um, I'll actually put a mic that I'll build 
on the bass cab, and that's just taking a speaker and reversing it in, to, to create a microphone out yeah. of it. So like and, a sub. Kind of yeah, sub it's like, a, like, like you would use on a kick drum, yeah. the same kind of idea, but put it on a bass cab too, and then you're gonna get those subtones there too. Cool. Yeah, have fun with that. And then I have to be honest, when I mix, a lot of times I'll have recorded uh, the DI track separately, and then I'll put the standard old Sans Amp plug-in on that. Great, the Sans Amp plug is great. Isn't it it's great? It's really good. It's yeah, like... and I track with compression on uh, the bass uh, when I'm recording. So that's one of the few things that I do use compression on when I'm recording live. Cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we had so many sure. questions last week about Pixie's bass sounds from various... Yeah, so we all, I, learned, I learned a lot about bass sounds last week. Yeah. So we're all going to steal Gil's bass yeah. sounds. By year? By year, as we'd say in Cardiff. Like. <laughs> um, we've, we've all probably here worked on projects that we thought were going to be absolutely amazing. You know, they kind of resonated with us as we were recording with them, but then they just kind of like... You know, got released and like no one ever heard them. Was there, we've all, we've all, we've all heard like the, the amazing projects you've done, but is there like some album that you've worked on that you thought, oh my god, this is going to fucking blow people's minds, but it never took off, that we should check out? No. Oh, wow. There's, so there's always so many, right. isn't there? <laughs> You'd be surprised at, at uh, so much good material that's out there. Like even the, the records that uh, Rick Rubin does that, that you've never heard of. That, and there's as many, you know, uh, and, but uh, gosh, there's a lot. I go, oh, you know, the one that I, I just finished that I hope doesn't die on the vine like that is this Adrian T. Bell record. Yeah, that's, that, uh, that's really cool. That. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, but there, there's, uh, there's a lot, you know, but there's always, uh, there's always going to be those things and then there's going to be the, the shining, the shining, um, the shining projects that sh that come through. There'll always be more that don't succeed than do, oh, yeah. just by the sheer weight of work that you do over a, a lifetime producing. And it's like, if if you if all you have at, at that record, and the artist needs to make the record for themselves first, rather than think about what's going to happen beyond this. You've just got to make the record for yourself. And there's records that I love to bits that I sort of. That nobody's heard and nobody's bought on records that I've made. I think are distinctly average and sold a lot of records. So you just don't know. And you just, all you can do is make the best record you can. And ultimately, if all if it's just you and the artist, have got to listen to in twenty years time and go, that was a fucking great record to make, and we had a brilliant time doing it. That's kind of something, you know. And that's and that maybe that's all you get out of it. But it's still great, you know. And then you just hope that a few of them take off. But most, you know, it, the percentages tend to be most records will not be massive. Well, even the, the, uh, the two New Zealand artists that I worked with uh, at my studio in Weed, they, those, both of those records were freaking great. Yeah. And, you know, they never made it to the States. That was Fornax Chemica and, and Zed. Zed. The Zed record, I think, was pretty big, yeah. 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 Who else we got? Oh, at the back? At the back with the hat. What's on that hat? Oh, it's a neurosis emblem. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I was just wondering if you um, recall how the secret track in Undertow came about. Oh. One of the cicadas. And okay. The okay, it's really a weird story. Is <laughs> that the weird ones? Okay. So we did go out and record uh, the quiet night time with cicadas and stuff. But that, that little secret thing at the very end, and it's a phone call, it's, a, it's, it's actually an actual message that was on Maynard's um, answering machine from his landlord. And it's the creepiest thing, but that wasn't a real message. Are you, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, so that voice is a message. Yeah, Yeah, and that was an actual message that he just saved, and then we put it in. But, uh, but... Uh, the whole thing. What, yeah, was, on, what I, uh, was on the message? It was daylight when you woke up in your ditch, etc. Yeah, something about laying in a ditch or something. <laughs> it's just so creepy. And then, Not and then what from your landlord. It seemed appropriate that there should be some crickets chirping like you're actually laying in the ditch and you're, you know... 
So yeah, that was uh, not an actual person. That it wasn't a, it wasn't staged at all. That was an actual message. <laughs> Very creepy. I, I I went to the Ken Scott um, uh, seminar a couple, of, a couple of years ago, and uh, you had the multi tracks for Life on Mars, and you know, there's all those kind of sound effects and stuff at the end. That was the studio phone. There was, a, there was a phone in the actual studio recording area, and the phone and the phone at the end. It was actually the phone ringing. And I think it was David getting up to go and pick up the phone, and it was like, um, yeah. So it was it was actually just just happened. Well, they got yeah. to the end of the take, and there was the take they liked, and they kept the. Uh, Isn't that the way it goes? That uh, you know, they, these the accidents or these random things that make the best fodder for for uh, albums or music projects. I, 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 do you feel that sort of because you know mistakes are, they are the sort of that's where the sort of you know the the depth of the recordings come with, with things that uh, the humanity in recordings. I mean, do you feel that that's getting lost in, in sort of modern recording techniques? That you tend to uh, you tend to get rid of those little moments that you'd you'd really love on sort of tw after twenty listening. So, well, I, I I think absolutely that they, if everyone is using sampled instruments, in that, that you're not going to have any mistakes. You know, um, quantization and uh, pitch correction. And, uh, yeah, so I I, uh, I, st I love to go backwards with some of that, just to purposely create situations where you're going to have plenty of mistakes to, to embrace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, it's no, it's for, no reason for shodding this, obviously, but yeah, that's keeping some of those on. So, yeah. we've got time for a couple more questions. Oh, um, here, and then we'll come to you. Um, Phil Spector once made a Joe Ramone player sing a guitar chord for 20 hours. Have you tortured any of your musicians in such ways? <laughs> that was, was that the first yes. quarter of Rock and Roll High School? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, God, that, that brings me to a couple of stories here. Um, first of all, I have a Phil Ramone story. <laughs> Whoa. Go tell. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I am actually Phil Ramone's pen pal in prison. <laughs> I, I get uh, mail from Phil, and it's the, the it's pretty frightening. It's like scrawl this. The, I don't know how the letters get to me because it, you can't understand the the insanity in the mind that wrote these the, these notes. It's just it's anyway. So okay, torturing guitar players. I did I recently have a singer, uh, um, in order to get the right kind of performance, uh, I asked him to drink a bottle of whiskey, and, and, uh, uh, and he did, and, and he was completely smashed out of his mind, and like with a, you know, and he typically didn't drink that much. So this was a, it was a, it was a, it re I really got the right performance that I was looking for. But I think I, he had a hell of a hangover and was kind of suffering for the next couple of days. Um, I did have a singer, the, the singer from System of a Down, I had him hang upside down to do a part. And I guess I normally just torture singers. Well, I think I deserve it, don't you? <laughs> But when he was he was upside down and there was a part in the song where he was screaming and I felt so bad because his eyes bugged out of his head his face got really red so I made him stop and then we stopped doing that I never hung anyone upside down and like that again. how did you have you didn't gap or take him to a wall or anything did you no but that there's a story about that <laughs> but I yeah Peter Peter Gabriel actually got gaffered to the wall we did, Bob is it Bob Bob, Bob did that yeah, yeah. yeah yeah there's always all kinds of fun stories about that in fact I collected all these stories Stories and put out a book called uh, Recording Unhinged, which is a collection of stories from myself and other producers uh, about these kind of uh, recording techniques. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Nothing, no torturing. Well, of course, I torture everyone, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Bass, bass players? They're yeah, fun to they, torture. Yeah. They always seem to be the whipping boys in the band as well. So the rest of the band, they used to be in torture because the rest of the band are always torturing them. <laughs> I, I find anyway. Do you want to, you got a question? 
I can see all of Hi. Um, I, I, I sort of want to just ask, I, I'm really tempted to ask you about your sphincter diagrams that you drew for your <laughs> singer's pitches, but I won't. But that's really not <laughs> I, I feel it fraudulent because you've been talking these wonderful stories about these incredible stars who are my heroes as well. And I run a really basic studio in the sort of middle of nowhere, but I love it. And, and most people coming only have a day or two. Yeah. And I try and have lovely equipment and do best work possible for every band that comes in. But you're aware at the end of most sessions there's a huge compromise about where you would wish it was yeah. versus the reality of where it had been in a given day's recording. Do? Yeah, have you got kind of a think a couple of things like priority things or a way of dealing with that? Not that. Yeah, the problem is that um, if if you truly want to finish it the way that you want to, then you have to work for free. Yeah, <laughs> which true. sucks, well, but, but at least you can get it done yeah. and it done it the way that you want, mm. and then you do something good for the artist too. I mean, my manager would hate for me to even say that, but I, if I if I have to, I'll. I'll kick in the time to finish it the right way. We were talking about this with, with Gil, and we well, also talked about it yesterday, with um, just the amount of hours that you've got to put in just to get good, and most of those, you know, and the sacrifices you've got to make to be in this job. And we all agreed it's the greatest job in the world to do. It's the greatest job. But it's like, to get to the point where you can just <laughs> make a living at it is really difficult, and it requires just like massive amount of commitments of time and, 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 and energy. You know. Well, like, let's say if if this art if one of the artists that you're working with is truly worthy mm -hmm. and is going to hand to you the uh, all your creative uh, effort, you know, like here take my project and make something special out of it, and it becomes your project mm -hmm. too. Of course, uh, that's when I would really put more time into it. But then on the other hand, I would also write up a contract <laughs> that, that would include you in case you never know. I mean, if, if you know, you know, 15% uh, of nothing is nothing until it's something. And so it's best to to be straight about those things ahead of time. And then, then you don't feel like you're completely giving everything away. Yeah. Or trade for gear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, um, one thing we are that myself and Chris Chatman uh, are in the process of setting up here at the moment is a music producers guild um, in order to give musicians protections for like them to guarantee that they get they know what they're entitled to on records and um, that's something if you just we'll we'll do some announcements over the next few weeks we'll do some preliminary meetings next week but it's something that I feel that there are some protections needed for producers here because you know, we want to sustain careers beyond. 30 years old when you start having families and having mortgages and it's like so it's kind of important that, and and you know this is something that we we'll, that we will look at and we've, and we've been chatting with Sylvia and Gail and stuff while they've been over and having lots of meetings about it so you know keep your eyes open and we'll you know but um yeah so we can all get what, what we're entitled well, to. Well until that time comes where it is a, a law that a certain percentage goes to the creators. Because you've been having these discussions with creators. the um, with the, uh, the steering committee of the Grammys. Right, at the, in NERAS, uh, the National Academy in the States, it, it, uh, until those laws are passed where there is uh, automatically a chunk of, of uh, a copyright set aside for the producers, then it, you have to go in with the paper and just to have an agreement with your artist. And, um, and it's hard to do. It's because, so because you, hard to do. You naturally want to make the records, and you want to work with those really good artists. But yeah. you know, you to sustain a career, it's, it's it, you need to have those other things in place as well. And sometimes uh, you can't anticipate how good something will turn out, and then all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, this is shit. It doesn't matter. Don't need a contract. Not worried about it. You're and then all of a sudden <laughs> something happens halfway through, and then all of a sudden you kind of bring in the contract. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you what you will not get a contract signed after the mixes are already handed over. It, it, yeah. you, just, you have to do it ahead of time, somehow. I mean, it's a good way is also, like, if you, if you have a master and engine you use, you know, you, you, as producer, keep the download codes. Don't let the, the artist download the finished master so all the bills are paid. I mean, I've, I've, have, you know, I have an agreement with Sterling Sound in New York, and, and I, I, I own all the masters until all the bills are paid, until all the engineers and the studios and everything are paid. Just yeah, never hand over finished masters until the records, until till everyone involved's been paid. It's a really it's a simple rule, but as you know, as producers, we you know we're musicians as well. We want to you know want to make sure the artist is happy, but you have to have you know a business brain as well to sustain the career. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I'm not going to ask you about the sphincter diagrams at some point <laughs> during the week. 
but I, that, maybe that's for like you know, sort of late night session. Maybe. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming, Sylvia. We, it's been amazing to have you here. We, you know, everyone's been so thrilled to get uh, for you to, to come over and um, and uh, can we have a big hand, please, for Legend? <laughs>